Thank you very much. Uh, I am phenomenally thrilled to be speaking at Force 11. This is the third time I've been to this conference, but the first time I've had an opportunity to speak here. I think it's been an amazing two days. I thank you all for your attention and willingness to stick around. I have a lot of material, so I'm going to go whip, whip fast through this. The first thing I want to say is... This is primarily the work of Julia Lane and Paco Nathan. Uh, my contribution has been very small, but I'm very proud to be able to tell you about the work that they've been doing. Uh, these are some of the topics that I will cover in my talk. These are all very appropriate for this conference. Sadly missing in the piece of work that we're going to talk about today are persistent identifiers. And that is at the heart of one of the problems that we're trying to address with, with this piece of work. Um, I just pulled up this quote from a friend of mine who works in the reinsurance industry. He told me his job is increasingly moving from writing code to knowing what the right libraries are to use and what the right problems are to collaborate on. And when we begin to try and work on interesting and new challenges, I think one of the key tools we have at our disposal is how we can build communities to help short circuit finding answers to those problems. But I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about the context of what these open competitions were used in and the problem that we were trying to solve. And the primary name of the project that this is involved with is called the Rich Context Project. Uh, it's a project that has come out from a research group in NYU called the Coldridge Initiative. Uh, they have a vision to change the empirical foundations of social science, statistical and public agencies in the United States and transform understanding of how our society works. And the primary tool that they have done to try and do this is, uh, this is their team, is created um, a, a piece of infrastructure out of NYU called the Administrative Data Research Facility. Now, this is a group who is looking at economic indicators. They're looking at administrative data sets. Uh, administrative data sets are often data sets that are produced by government through the process of government. And these kinds of data have some very particular challenges around them. Uh, the data is often highly sensitive, information like unemployment insurance wage records or criminal records. Uh, it requires extremely restricted access to that data, um, and cross-walking between two different data sets can be extremely hard. As well as that, the people who are working in government often have very low skills of doing data analysis. Um, and I would say what we're seeing in the social sciences with data sets like this and the desire to work on data sets like this is uh, probably... The social sciences are in a place where biomedicine was 10 or 15 years ago. There's a massive explosion of social science data, but the tooling, the methods, the practices of how to work with that data is only beginning to emerge now. Uh, what the Coleridge Initiative did with the uh, Administrative Data Research Facility is they built a cloud infrastructure for merging those data sets together with fine-grained reporting so that you could have those kinds of admin controls that you need. But the other thing that they did a lot of work on was building... Uh, training materials and programs that would bring um, uh, people working in government together in workshops physically to learn the data science skills and learn about the shape and nature of the data to help them understand what data was being represented and, and, and how it was being described in those data sets. And in fact, uh, the ADRF was cited in um, a policy paper called The Promise of Evidence-Based Policymaking, which led on to... Uh, be one of the pieces of, of work that um, uh, supported the U.S. government Open Data um, uh, uh, Act. So I, I mentioned earlier that um, they want to try and do this in an evidence-based way, but what the challenge here is they want to be able to identify which publications have made use of which of these kinds of administrative data sets. Um, and they want to create a rich context around the connections between those links, between those papers and those administrative data sets. And they have this idea of ultimately creating a knowledge graph around this kind of data for uh, uh, being able to allow people who um, have published the papers to see how that data is being used by other researchers or people who have interest in topics around those questions being able to get access to the data directly. However, in the social sciences, there is a very poor history of creating identifiers for these data sets. And there is a very poor practice of how those data sets are cited in the literature. So this is the challenge that we wanted to try and solve through this competition that we ran. 
And so the idea is, could we leverage machine learning to try and build and create models that could help identify the references to these papers, these data sets, from the full text of the papers? Um, the team at NYU had some limited experience of working with machine learning models. And so um, they launched uh, this competition, the competition that I wanted to tell you about, called the Rich Context Competition. Uh, it was launched in September of 2018, ran through to February. And they wanted to phase the competition in two phases. People who passed the first phase, those teams would win $2,000. And the final winner of the competition had a prize pot of $20,000 to, to try and uh, go for. Uh, one of the key points of the competition is that all of the outputs had to be made publicly available. Um, the stated goal that the teams had to work towards was to build a machine learning model that could identify data sets, could identify the research fields, and also the methods used in the papers. So the way we did this is we provided the teams with a corpus of 2,500 papers, which we knew had referenced the kind of data that was interest to this community. They were also given 2,500 papers uh, as kind of null examples where we were aware that those papers had no references to the data. This was the training corpus that they had to work with to build their models. Um, we held back from those teams uh, an equivalent data set uh, of 5,000 papers of the same kind as the papers that they were doing their training on. Um, the way we found the papers that had references to the data is we sourced those papers from two sources. The Bundesbank uh, was one of the big partners in this project, and they have an internal database of research papers that they use for economic forecasting, and they were able to help by providing papers that they had tagged manually that had references to some of these data sets. Uh, the other source was the ICPRF, ICPSR catalog, who hosts some of this administrative data and has a requirement for anyone who cites their data to let them know, and so they have a database of papers who have used their data. Uh, but just knowing the papers with the data was not going to be sufficient to help the models be built. So we went through a process of annotating those 2,500 papers to try and find where in the papers the text was that actually mentioned the data sets. Um, the contribution that SAGE made uh, is many of the papers were SAGE papers, so we were able to help provide the full text of those papers. Uh, and we also extracted our own author keywords and our own ontology around methodologies and subject matter headings for the papers. And so that was another source of the training data for the teams to work on. So that was essentially my only contribution to this project. I want to be very clear about that. Um, so uh, this is just an example of the tool that the team in NYU built for the tagging of those data sets to create what we were calling our golden standard data set. Um, it, it was hand built by the team in NYU. They did go out and look uh, at other tools on offer in the market, but didn't find any that were good for the purposes of this. And they had um, these uh, postdocs work to try and pr provide that tagged data set. But it was a bit of a challenge because the way that the data sets are being mentioned is often quite um, uh, informal. And so this is an example of one of the bits of information that was given to the teams. And you can see that there are like four different phrases for how this one data set was mentioned in a given paper. And so this is at the heart of why this is a difficult challenge in the social sciences. Uh, the second phase of the competition would be where we would give those teams 5,000 unlabeled publications, and they had to discover the data sets that they had trained their models on in the first phase of the uh, competition against this new set of 5,000 papers, and also report back on the research methods and fields that they had identified for those papers. So that's the structure of the competition. Um, the way we structured the submissions to the competition is the, the, the research teams who participated had to provide the code and the team at NYU created a packaging script for them. So the packaging script could take their code, dockerize it, put it into a Docker container, um, which would allow us to run, run their, their entries. And they were given instructions that the, their code had to run from the command line, uh, be fed a specific pathway for the data that was the test data, and have output in a specific format. So that was the parameters of how the teams had to participate in the competition. And then they just created the Docker container uploaded it to a box file, and then the team in NYU 
manually downloaded that, span up the instance, ran the models, and then tried to see if they were getting any coherent results at all. Uh, so the way we judged the competition is we had the 5,000 papers that was their training set, we had the 5,000 papers that we had held back, and we just created a confusion. We basically just checked how many of the papers they got right in terms of references to research articles that we knew about in advance. Um, for, for judging the quality of research methods and subject headings for the papers, uh, across about 15 different subdisciplines of the social sciences, we took 10 random papers from the selections, and we just asked a set of experts to compare what the models were coming up with with their own expertise on those 10 random papers. And then we cross-correlated those experts' judgments to come up with a score for the teams. So we had uh, 20 teams from around the world participating. We had participants from North America, Spain, Germany, but also from Singapore, from Korea, from India. Uh, so we were pretty happy with the fact that teams had actually gone away and tried to create models for us to address this problem that NYU had. Um, another nice aspect of the competition is of the 20 teams that submitted, uh, six teams were student teams. Uh, four finalists made it through. One of those was a student team. And then uh, the Allen Institute, the Allen AI Institute won, but we gave a commended uh, a reward to a student team from Korea who'd come up with a very novel approach that we hadn't seen before. And so we kind of basically split the final pot of cash, 15K to Allen, 5K to Keist. Um, the results were better than random, but not amazing. So uh, the models, basically, the best models across the, the phase one and phase two found about half of the data sets that we knew were present in the papers, which, like... We were pretty delighted with that as a result, uh, but it's, and, and it has been good enough for Deutsche Bank to use internally for some of their projects, but we recognize it's not good enough to solve the problem completely. Uh, so some of the problems that we had in running the competition, the annotators who were trying to get the annotations on those two and a half thousand papers sometimes weren't able to find a mention of the paper at all. So we had it from the ICPRS catalog that there was meant to be a link there, but they couldn't find the mentioned link in the paper. And there was a bit of time pressure in getting that tagging done, so that might have been responsible. Teams were identifying data sets that we didn't know about. So their models were accurately identifying data sets, but we weren't able to score them on it because we hadn't realized that those data sets were in the papers initially. And, and then another issue is a lot of the code that was contributed in those Docker containers basically didn't run, was very painful to get running, we had to work hand in hand with those teams very closely to get them to get it to run. And so the scalability of actually running the final entries was, was a bit tough. Um, but there were some really good outputs from this phase of the competition. We had a, a workshop in February where eight teams met in New York. They shared experiences during the day about the approaches they had made. Some modified their models based on that interaction. Uh, we're writing a book about our experience where we'll detail the models that were used by each of the teams, but also some of the overarching ideology behind the competition and the project. It'll be published as an OA book by Sage, which is, but puts me in the weird position of working for Sage and also being a Sage author. And now I'm getting to see what the experience is like for our authors. Lots of opportunity for improvement. Uh, uh, we have a workshop in November coming up in a couple of weeks. Um, and there we are gathering about 60 or 70 of the world's leading experts in knowledge graphs uh, and on machine learning to help discuss how this community could move forward with this as an initiative. And we've got some really good funders who are interested in supporting it coming to that workshop too. And we're going to run the competition again. We're going to take some of the things that we've learned from the first time of running that competition and try to improve them. Uh, so one of the ways that we're going to try to improve that competition is uh, we are trying to learn from the machine learning community itself, who have a history of running competitions uh, using leaderboards. And so these are two examples, NLP Progress and Papers with Code. And you can go to those sites, and there they list ongoing competitions that are about building models within the context of some very specific uh, com computer science areas or challenge areas. And you can click into any of those particular competitions, and you can see which models that have been submitted are currently performing the best. And so there's an ongoing public feedback on who's doing best with 
the competition in real time. So we want to build a leaderboard for the second version of, of our competition. Um, we're going to work on a new submission process. So uh, we will ask people to submit by GitHub to, into GitHub. So their submissions will be open by default. Uh, rather than wrapping their submissions into a Docker container, uh, they will be asked to provide their submissions as a, as a Jupyter notebook. So we're hoping that we'll make the submissions reproducible by default. And then we'll be evaluating them using Binder. And so we're hoping that will make the competition more scalable by default. Um, we're also going to try using a type of machine learning for the second phase of the competition called transfer um, learning. Uh, so with transfer learning, you take an existing model that has been trained on a similar kind of a problem, and then rather than training it ab initio from scratch, you just train that existing model with some specific use cases and specific examples of data for your problem to generate a new model. But it allows you to get a functioning model quickly whilst training a much small, on a much smaller data set. So we're going to move from an initial corpus of 5,000 papers that we're training on to just 500. But that means we can do a much, much better job of tagging the connections to the data sets and avoid some of the problems that we had in the first round. And one of the teams that worked on the first phase of the competition has been helping create this leaderboard. And they ran uh, a new version of the model with the new training uh, protocol. And they've got up to uh, identifying about three quarters of the, the data sets in that first run. So there's already been a significant improvement through this approach. Um, one of the other things that we want to do is when those models are coming online, we'd like to get feedback from the community. So uh, Repec is uh, participating in this. Who The Repec are a an economics uh, preprint server. Uh, Sage is going to con uh, contribute in this as well. And so the way this will work is as papers are submitted to Repec, the models will be run on those papers. And then if a, if a data set is identified, Repec is just going to email the author and go, hey, we think you mentioned this data set. Do we get it right or do we not get it right? And if we get it right, that's great. But if we didn't, we can take that back and help retrain the models. And so basically create what's often known in, the, in, in this area as a human-in-the-loop pattern. And we're going to try and do the same with this set of journals uh, that we have at Sage who are, are in this area of interest as well. Uh, so uh, we've already started working on some of the modeling of the kinds of ontologies that we're going to use for this knowledge graph. And I just wanted to give a big shout out that uh, Paco, who's been working on this, picked Cito as the citation ontology and vocabulary. And I know this community has been hugely involved in developing that. So that's really good. Um, and the Jupyter project is also a co fundy of some of the grants that have been going into this. So they're working on a, a data explorer. And one of the goals of this is to create a registry of these connections between papers and data, but then to expose that registry so that if you're working in an area or in a domain, you can go and access or crosswalk into the data directly from Jupyter. That's one of the goals of the project. So to summarize, uh, we um, used competition format to engage the machine learning community. They got engaged. They built some models. The models could have been better, but we got actual traction, which was great. Uh, we recognize that there's potential to grow an nascent community around this. And so things like the book, the second competition, and the workshop will hopefully move that forward. And our bet is that looking to build this in a way that it can integrate directly with researchers' workflows is going to be the way that we need to do this. Uh, we're trying to streamline the second version of the competition, and our current focus is on the November workshop. We're hoping to get guidance from experts on how we can help direct and move the, the project forward. So there's a link on how to participate if you're interested. But as I was coming up on the train um, on Monday, I just had a bit of a thought that I wanted to share with, with this group. So there's a great um, interaction designer called Brett Victor who talks about the utility of tools and how a tool is essentially something that can magnify your capability against a need in the world. And I was thinking, as a community, we have these purposes that we want to work to in the world and change that we want to have and that we want to see. And some of the kinds of tools that we're used to talking about as a community are things like research papers, data sets, codes, the structures of the communities that we're involved in. And by and large, we kind of know how to use these tools. We know how to govern them. We kind of know how they respond when they're used in the world, more or less, because we've been talking about it for 20 years. But there's a new tool that's coming into our capability now, the machine learning tools. And I don't believe that we have answers to these kinds of questions around these machine learning tools. Where should they sit? How should they be updated? How should they be governed? How should, be, how should we be aware of whether and when bias is entering into those tools and models? So I think this is a really interesting moment. And I think these will be 
a kind of object that will become increasingly important and the kinds of conversations we've had about these other kinds of research objects we should soon start to have about machine learning models. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, do we have any questions? Uh, yep, just there. Yeah, thanks, Ian. Um, I'm curious about the choice of a platform. Um, there are some platforms out there like Kaggle and others that have been uh, used for a while. I'm curious about the thoughts that went into choosing, you know, come up with that specific uh, uh, set for the submission evaluation of, uh, of the entries. Uh, so that's... Um primarily being led by Paco, Nathan, who used to be head of learning at O'Reilly. And he knows the Kaggle people really well. He's aware of the machine learning communities really well. And he just felt that it was tractable and feasible to do this on, on GitHub as, a, as, a, as like the easiest initial way forward in the timeline that we had. So when he was suggesting this and started going out to build that pipeline, we, we didn't feel like we, we would want to tell him to try and do something different. Yeah. Okay. This is Naomi Asep Bio. Thank you for the talk, Ian. I'm over here. Hi. Hello. When you put your slide, you said about next time we're going to use Jupyter Notebooks and then we're going to evaluate with Binder. And yeah. I thought, listening to earlier talks from Dario earlier today, oh, how are you supporting Jupyter folks to maintain their, their project? And then you said that Jupyter are actually a co-fundee on a particular thing. So I'm just wondering how much that support extends to the project they're doing versus the maintenance of Jupyter as a whole and, and how are you acting in this space? I, I don't know the answer to that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, what format, was there a particular format that you gave these, the, the, the files? Oh, that's a great question. We gave them the files in PDF and they used some uh, command line utility to go from PDF to text and that actually caused some of the problems with the, with the, with the training data as well, yeah. yeah. It caused a lot of discussion on that workshop. In, in March, yeah. Any other questions? I just really liked your last point about, I've never heard about governance for machine learning models. I was wondering what ideas you had in that direction. So um, I think there's a, there's a lot of discussion in the AI community around this. And I th so I think um, Transfer learning is is giving people a lot of power to create models with smaller training sets and figuring out how to get good feedback into those models with the training data can help that approach work really well. And so one area of thinking about the architecture of governance is asking what are the right pathways where we're seeing the results and who should be involved in, in providing that feedback. And so we're beginning to try that in this project with Repec and with Sage, but those are just because these are partners who are uh, available to work on this project with us. But I think there's a wider question when machine learning models start to have applicability to other areas of the kinds of questions we're interested in. How do we involve people in making sure that the predictions are being retrained appropriately? And IBM, uh, last year I saw them presenting um, a system where models for um, assessing whether people are uh, uh, candidates who can receive insurance uh, or not, they can put in place um, uh, uh, rules that say, for example, if this model is disproportionately saying no to female applicants, then that might be trained in the model, but that's just a rule that we'll put overhead, which we should get an alert on to indicate to us that the model is behaving in a way that we think is socially unacceptable. So I think those are that's another area of governance that you can look to. But the overall question is still a very open one and uh, and needs to be addressed. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we do have time for another question if anyone has one. No. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much again, Ian, thank uh, you. for your talk. Uh, there are no more.